our conversations <laughs> about burnout and well-being as even a broader conversation have continued since um, our, our last date. And uh, I think this is just a, so a conversation that we keep adding to and thinking of more and more things um, to add into the mix. So it's timely. And thanks for joining us, John, and, and welcome to everyone. Uh, my name is Stacey de Calmer and I manage sector development for uh, the Queensland Council of Social Service, the peak body for community organisations in Queensland. And it's my pleasure to host this webinar today. Um, before I hand over to John, who's our guest speaker for today, I want to acknowledge the Yugger and Turrbal people. It's on their land that I'm on today here in Brisbane, uh, along the Brisbane River. I want to acknowledge their continuing connection to this land, to these waterways, to this place, and thank them for their continuing care. Uh, and of course, I extend that acknowledgement to First Nations people on the line, and of course, the country that you're all on um, today. And if you'd like to acknowledge country, I welcome you to do so uh, in the chat. <clears throat> now, um, John, you do a lot of work in um, analysing what burnout means uh, to the workforce and you have been um, conducting some studies over a, a period of time now and have some really interesting things to share about uh, burnout and the effects of burnout on our workforce. Of course, as a peak body, this is a really interesting um, and uh, important issue for us to be considering as we support organisations through um, a, a significant workforce crisis at the moment. We have shortages um, and that's just one thing that impacts uh, the, the effect of the, the prominence of burnout out in the sector. Um, I'm going to hand over to you because I know you've got a presentation to share and, and let the participants know a little bit more about the work that you do. Thanks, John. Hey, thanks so much for that introduction, uh, Stacey. Um, and thanks for everyone for taking the time to um, learn a bit more about this topic that I'm really passionate about. Um, as Stacey mentioned, uh, my name is John Chan. Uh, my background is as of an organizational psychologist and I head up Infinite Potential. Uh, we are not for profit, a think tank that's dedicated to kind of developing high quality research and insights and practical solutions to kind of addressing some of these really key and pressing problems that we see in the workplace. Uh, our purpose is to help organizations create um, those environments where people can really bring out you know, and see their um, the full potential that they um, that they can really bring to organizations. And I really believe that kind of sort of alleviating burnout and kind of creating these sustainable workplaces is really one of the most critical issues um, for the workplace that we're needing to deal with. You know, not just for the health of our people, but as really a key to unlocking this future of work uh, and productivity that we kind of keep discussing. Um, um, Bear with me for one second. I'm going to share my screen. There we go. Can everybody see my screen? Also, are you still with me? <laughs> uh, we're still with you and the screen okay, perfect. Okay. Thanks, John. Okay, thanks so much. Um, so I'll, I'll just get right into it. You know, I just, I'd like you to just kind of imagine for a moment there, uh, you know, a person waking up in the morning and it's already exhausted at the thought of all the work they're going to have to get through that day. Or maybe, you know, a person getting a slight cough or scratchy throat and their first sense is one of relief, you know, that maybe, hey, if I'm sick, I might be able to take some time off. Or even a person uh, going through the emotions at work and wondering if they're, have they made the right career decision in a profession that, you know, they used to love and they maybe something that they have always wanted to do, but now they are really questioning their own life choices. Now, many of us might uh, will have experienced this emotions firsthand or know of someone that have uh, experiences. For a person going through and experiencing burnout, now their mode is they're in survivor mode, right? And the only thing on their to-do list really is just to get through the day. And for a lot of organizations and leaders, they know this is um, a big problem and it's on top of their minds. And for a lot of organizations, they poured in a lot of resources to try trying to solve this issue. But even with all of this attention, we know that burnout continues to grow. And so in today's session, we'll kind of discuss some of the, uh, we'll really get into um, uh, burnout and some of the root causes for that. We'll explore some of the factors that cause 
burnout. And we'll go over um, some of the latest research and insights from our global uh, burnout study. Uh, I'll provide some suggestions for next steps and how to take actions on this problem. Um, I'll leave some time at the end uh, for some Q&A in case there are any questions that you'd like to discuss. But please uh, feel free uh, throughout the conversation to use the chat function uh, for any questions or comments uh, that you'd like us to kind of come back to. So um, hope this session provides you with a better understanding and some, you know, insights that you can take away um, about burnout. So one thing I wanted to kind of start off with is, you know, in, the, in 2020, Deloitte did this uh, study where 80% of senior executives said that well-being was their number one priority. You know, the health of our people is their top priority. Uh, so that's 80%. Not, that, that's pretty high. Um, and in the same report that was released earlier this year, that same report showed that 90% of workers indicated that their work life is getting worse. So there's a big gap in what leaders are um, have done in the last couple of years and experience from, from the workers. And what we are seeing um, in terms of a trend is that you know, there's definitely a kind of a, a person factor uh, in terms of the burnout, but it's also there's also a financial uh, factor to consider as well. Um, uh, during 2020 to 2021, uh, there were over 12,000 serious claim cases for mental health uh, conditions, with the majority of these being stress-related disorders. And while mental health conditions still account for a relatively small proportion of these uh, serious claims, the rates are rapidly uh, growing. Um, if you kind of look at the last couple of years, they really have uh, skyrocketed. And what we can see from this is that serious work place mental health conditions um, it's quite costly in terms of if you look at the median compensation paid it's about 55,000 um, per serious claim compared to 13,000 around 14,000 for a serious physical injury uh, a claim uh, same with the median time lost if you on the screen, you'll see uh, for a serious mental health uh, claim, it's about 30.7 weeks uh, for each of those claims compared to um, about 6.2 weeks for a serious physical um, injury. So you know, seeing this trend, um, I know the Queensland government with all of the other states um, have all recently updated their work health and safety legislation to include psychosocial risk and hazards. So now this is something that you know, all organizations really need to pay attention to because uh, it's going to be part of um, the governance that they'll be looking after. So what exactly is burnout? You know, we there's been a lot of media coverage on burnout and I'm sure all of you have been hearing this word thrown, being thrown around over the place. And a lot of times it's used kind of interchangeably with anything kind of stress related. Um, I said to myself the other day that I'm pretty burnt out on uh, almond croissants. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, we just kind of use that term over the place. Uh, for the record, I'm not over almond croissants. Still love those. Uh, but we kind of think about burnout as this intangible, you know, one of those things that we can't really define, but you know, I, I know it when I when I feel it. And right now, many of us uh, might be feeling that, you know, we are somewhere within that burnout uh, scale. Uh, however, it's sort of in order to really properly address um, burnout, we need to make sure that we have the same definition and we're using the same kind of guidelines in talking about this. So in 2019, the World Health Organization defined um, burnout as a syndrome resulting from chronic workplace stress that has not been successfully managed. So this definition was really helpful in kind of providing clarity and creating consistency for you know those of us who do read research and also those who are really looking into how to combat uh, this. Um, you know, this definition show that burnout is caused by organizational structures and cultures uh, that's creating this chronic stress in individuals. Now, what this de definition also means is that burnout refers to an experience specific to work, and it shouldn't be used to describe what a person might be experiencing in their personal life. Now, it doesn't mean a person can't experience Experience extreme levels of unmanageable life stress. I, you know, I think that is definitely something that uh, happens. Um, 
but it's different than, than burnout. And so when we talk about a burnout, you know, the mindset, you know, just think about it like champagne, you know, it can only come from one, uh, from one area. It's, it's a very work specific um, type of thing. And so, you know, if we, if you just take one thing away from today's discussion, uh, I'll take this away, that burnout is the result of chronic workplace stress, and it's not the fault of the individuals. And the solution to preventing uh, burnout is not focused on the individual. So, you know, we see a lot out there uh, of these individually focused um, solutions to, uh, looking at a burnout, and you know, trying to address burnout with these individually targeted solutions like resilience training um, in isolation, it's going to do very little uh, when a person is stuck in that environment or in that culture with this unmanaged uh, stress. It will eventually break down, uh, it'll break, eventually break down anybody um, within that environment. So we got to really look at that systemic um, root causes of what's causing all of this stress. So. Um, According to the World Health Organization's uh, definition, burnout consists of three dimensions. Uh, first is that feeling of physical, emotional, and mental exhaustion. This is why the trait that we're all very uh, familiar with. This can also uh, see, be seen as sort of a complete lack of motivation or energy to engage with anything. Uh, they, um, it's sort of the result, uh, and, and it kind of creates that that cycle of becoming too exhausted, then not wanting to engage, and then actually creates probably more uh, exhaustion, uh, thinking about all the work that you have to do. And you know, once you start going down that spiral, it's very difficult to get, kind of get out of. The second dimension there is that increased feelings of disengagement or mental distance from your work and work relationships. So this is sometimes called depersonalization. Um, and signs of this could be you know, somebody who disengages uh, from their relationships at work or perhaps you know, binge on Netflix all day to kind of escape from the reality of where uh, of their kind of their work life. For many, they develop this really negative and cynical attitude towards their work and career. You, know, you just dislike everything about what you do, uh, even though this was something that you probably used to love. Uh, and finally, the third dimension is sort of that reduced, perfor, perfor, uh, reduced professional efficacy, which is kind of uh, that decline in once perceived competence or achievement in their work. Um, you know, that the individual going through this often have difficulty concentrating or performing at that level that they are used to, they used to be able to, you know, things that were really easy uh, for them, things that just come naturally to them, just everything becomes quite hard. They make a lot more mistakes. Um, everything just takes longer uh, to do and they're just not doing their um, best work. Uh, there's two things I want to note here before we move on. One is the first is that to be experiencing burnout, a person must be experiencing all three of these dimensions. So just simply being really exhausted or just you know, generally being disengaged with your work doesn't mean you're experiencing burnout. It's the combination of these three factors that creates a state of burnout in an individual. And you know, take a second to kind of think about your own experience. You know, most of us have had times where we're really exhausted with all the work, but you know, we are still really engaged in the work. We love what we do, and we're still um, performing at a really high uh, level. Or, and vice versa. You know, there might be times within your career where, yeah, you, you, know, you you're hitting all three um, of these kind of dimensions. Uh, and that goes to my other point on you know, burnout is a spectrum. It's not sort of a, you either have it or you don't. Um, it's not just having a bad day or you know, a tough week, anything like that. As it's being, as it's called by this chronic workplace uh, stress, which by its very nature, it can be really low level and it can be festering for months and even years uh, before a person really realizes that there's a problem. So most of us uh, will step in and out of um, these uh, type of feelings which is perfectly normal. It's when an individual kind of gets stuck in these um, kind of spirals in all three of these. And when all three of these are at the right element, they, the spiral kind of uh, feeds into each other on these three dimensions. That's when it becomes that really problematic and really difficult 
to kind of treat uh, kind of area. There's a general opinion out there that burnout is due to the default of the individual. You know, that person is experiencing burnout because there's something wrong with that person or that person isn't doing something uh, correctly or, or maybe that person just isn't cut out for uh, the role. And you know, for I think in a lot of organizations, admitting that you're experiencing burnout or even high levels of stress in a work setting you know, could be really career limiting. And so instead, people often just kind of suffer in silence um, until it's too late. And through decades of research, so you know, the research on burnout, it's been going on since the 1950s. Uh, there's six factors that consistently comes up as uh, the biggest contributors contributors uh, to stress that you know when it goes untreated or unmanaged it be kind of festers into and eventuates into uh, burnout so the first one there workload you know, that excessive and unmanageable uh, workload working long hours high job demands and time pressures um, that's you know, pretty, that that's the one I think <laughs> that contributes uh, to a lot of um, the burnout that we hear and talk about there. The second one is also uh, something that's quite common, which is that control and autonomy. Uh, when individuals don't have, or they feel like they don't have any control over the decisions that uh, is made, uh, how they use their own skills and abilities to do their work, or even have a say in what type of work uh, is being performed. So they just feel um, having no control and autonomy in any part of uh, their work, and that's really creates that feeling of kind of helplessness or reduced before, uh, mo reduced uh, motivation in the type of work that they do. Um, third piece there is on the recognition and reward, which is when an individual feels that their hard work just kind of goes unnoticed or and unappreciated. Um, the lack of organizational support, um, which is about um, you know, that the having those relationships within the organization or a feeling about the organization as a whole on how much they really do support their people. And if you kind of think about when issues arise uh, within the organization, do you, do you feel like your organization will back you in a decision uh, that's made? You know, do, you, do people feel like they can speak up and say, hey, we've got this problem here and that the organization will take that and um, try to fix that instead of you know, blaming the person who reported it, uh, things like that. Uh, unfair. In uh, treatment so that it's about you know, in terms of the equality of how people are treated within that organization. And finally, that values misalignment for some organizations, usually for the for, in the for profit kind of corporate world, are people's values really aligned to what they want um, to be uh, working on? You know, these factors. They're not stand, uh, as you can kind of imagine, they, they're not sort of standalone type of uh, factors, they all interact uh, with each other and they can vary in levels of intensity and impact depending on who that individual is and the work environment. So for example, for let's say um, a purpose-based uh, charities and community services organization, maybe that values alignment, is, maybe that's not a, a big problem, uh, whereas that workload and a reward might be a bigger problem, whereas for some other organizations, it might be actually the inequitable treatment and lack of organization support. So there's, uh, it really varies uh, for from organization and even within organization. What we've been seeing in the organizations we work with is there is differences um, in terms of different areas of the organization and what actually contributes uh, to stress uh, within each of that. There are a few mindset shifts that I kind of want to talk about. Uh, today in terms of kind of addressing burnout. There's some legacy thinking uh, that we really need to, um, uh, need to kind of start moving away from and think about burnout in a, a slightly different way. The first one there, we all kind of, uh, we see this quite a bit out there, you know, work-life balance, that's the key to avoiding burnout. Actually, uh, you know, the more modern thinking is that work is a determinant of well-being. Work is a part of um, a person's well-being. So it's not just simply splitting out, here's your work life, and then here's your um, here's your life life. <laughs> um, 
And let's just separate those out uh, so that you can kind of bounce that out. And really, we let's make the work life just as good um, and pleasant so that you don't have to try to balance the two. Make them as all part of an individual's um, overall kind of factor for uh, well-being. Another way to see thinking is that burnout alleviation and recovery is the responsibility of the individual. You know, if you are feeling burnout, why don't you go take a week off and figure it out and come back? Uh, you know, I think we, <laughs> we hear that quite a bit. Instead, um, really burnout is a shared responsibility between individuals and the organization. What can the organization do to ensure that the environment um, doesn't create these unmanageable stress? And also individuals also has a responsibility to uh, kind of voice their opinions on what's happening, what would they like to see? Um, so it, it's sort of a equal joint responsibility there. Another piece of legacy thinking, you know, solutions to burnout, their benefits and perks for the individual. If you get some gym membership or <laughs> yoga classes, that um, that's a benefit for the individual. Uh, instead of kind of thinking that way and having that individual focus solutions, really think more about and focus on the systemic improvements uh, to the organizational structures and cultures. And I know you guys are probably thinking, oh, well, that that's a lot harder. That's <laughs> and, and I think that's where the issue uh, comes in. And what we've seen is a lot of the resources and the money that's been poured in by organizations all go to that left hand side on. A new app. Here's a new uh, something for the individual, rather than doing the hard yards about. Okay, let's talk about our ways of working. How do we reduce load? Things like that. That's it, that's difficult and that's uh, that's complicated. And and I think that's one of the big reasons why we haven't been able to really um, move the dial on addressing burnout because we're not looking at those systemic and kind of uh, root cause. Um, of that. And finally, you know, we still measure productivity from that industrial age um, uh, where it's measured and rewarded by a number of hours worked, how much little um, widgets uh, you a uh, person kind of creates. And now, you know, within the more modern type of workplace, especially for knowledge um, based uh, workers, we really need to have a much more holistic view about product. Activity and that needs to be measured by a blend of level of activity, the quality of work, and the sustainability of the role. If you just look at the number of hours worked and not looking at the sustainability um, of the work, you know, just kind of burning people out um, through these roles, that is not a good you know, long term sustainable um, kind of productivity uh, measure. So, just a few things that um, we can talk about that. Um, if you want to talk about this in a bit more detail later. So yeah, you know, I think overall, we just need to change the conversation so that when we start seeing burnout in an organization, we need to look at the culture and the ways of working within that organization rather than how we might be able to fix our, our people. Uh, I was just trying to think about it like a river, right? When we start seeing some fishes uh, maybe dying in the river, we look at how we can make the river a better environment for the fish, you know, we clean it up. We see what the oxygen level is. Uh, uh, those things. We don't go looking for more resilient fishes uh, for our rivers. Right? We, we look at fixing uh, the environment where they're in. So I'll, I'll jump into um, the study uh, now. So um, for the past three years, Infinite Pentecto have been conducting this global longitudinal research on burnout. Uh, We've had over 8,000 participants from over 40 different countries participate in the study. Um, I'd like to share sort of these five key findings from uh, this year's study, and I'll also be sharing uh, the results of an index of, index of participants from the community services sector compared with other norms. So, um, during, during last year, we were able to get enough participation from the community service and uh, charity sectors to kind of be able to kind of create create a norm and a lot of um, and within the sectors uh, organizations I've been working with that was uh, really helpful and you know it's just one thing to compare yourself to the Australian uh, norm or even a global norm but seeing what the in the, your own sector 
uh, how they're doing uh, has been really helpful in kind of help, helping them gauge, okay, so where do we need to kind of focus on and are we doing okay uh, versus others? Um, so here's the five key uh, global findings that we um, were, or that we found this year. First, rates of burnout continues to grow while well-being continues to fall. Lack of organizational support is a really strong predictor for burnout. Uh, burnout significantly affects productivity and the quality of work. Burnout needs to be a part, really needs to be a part of that hybrid work conversation. And you know, organizations can create a competitive advantage by adapting these people-first uh, policies. So it's kind of going into some of the details here. So as you can see on the screen, unsurprisingly, you know, the rates of burnout continues to grow. If you look at um, the third battery there on global rates of burnout, you can see uh, from 2020, when we first started the study, it was tracking at around 29.6% in terms of the population that's experiencing burnout. And it's up to about 38.1% uh, in this, in last year's um, study. For the Australian population, interestingly, it's actually dropped um, a bit from 40 82.8% um, to down to 27.1%. And for the community services uh, index, so um, this is made up of just participants from the community services, uh, uh, we're looking at 34.7%. So pretty close to that global rate of burnout, but much higher than the Australian rate um, of burnout, uh, which is uh, interesting. And a really interesting insight and when we look at some of the demographics uh, here is that the age group uh, that's experiencing the highest level of burnout is dropping. So in the previous years, it really is that um, 45 to 55 kind of age group this year um, is dropped down to that 35 to 44 uh, age group. And we're seeing signs that that 25 to 34 age group is starting to experience a lot of, uh, it's growing in terms of the level of burnout that they are experiencing. And one thing, if you kind of look at the global uh, age group, that 80 to 24 um, age group um, is actually has become the highest, um, has the highest level of uh, burnout in the age group. Now, I gotta say with a caveat that that's, um, that population uh, is a lot smaller than in the other age groups. And this is something that we want to keep an eye out um, to make sure that maybe this is just a one year um, kind of nominally, um, but this is something we really want to keep an eye out for um, because as you guys can, as you can imagine, this is, this would be quite problematic if those are younger um, workers are experiencing burnout at such an early age, what that means for the future um, of our workforce. So um, definitely something to keep an eye out on. Uh, in terms of uh, gender, uh, women are experiencing higher levels across the board, no matter how you slice and dice uh, that. And um, looking at the area of service, I think this uh, will be especially interesting uh, for some of you here. We were able to um, have a big enough samples to kind of break this into specific types of areas of service and sort of the levels of burnout. Uh, the one that I want to point you out to is sort of that disability uh, support uh, services. They, um, it's quite high. It's definitely by far the highest uh, group, group that's experiencing uh, burnout. There were 57% of them reporting having experiencing burnout, followed by home and community care and uh, Child safety and child safety, mm, and that's a, that's um sorry to interrupt John, but that's a significant jump there uh, to um, the rate of burnout by area of service. Was there any commentary on that of the reasons why? Um, I think that's one of the things that we we really want to get um, deeper into. We know um, some of the symptoms of this, which is you know I think for disability support, the rates of turnover um, is really high and. And um, just from, and this is why I'm more anecdotal talking to those services that provide disability support and things like that. Uh, it's, it's a very difficult and challenging uh, role. And without a lot of the supportive, um, a lot of, without a lot of the support that kind of goes with it. And yeah, I think this is a challenge 
I don't think, uh, at least there's not an answer <laughs> at the moment, uh, but it's something to, uh, that get people are aware of what's happening and trying to think of a solution for this. Um, hopefully this year, um, we really do want to focus a bit more on getting more, more data to just make sure these trends kind of stabilize. And, um, and this is in fact, sort of the areas that we need to focus on, you know, Obviously, we want to make sure all of these areas of service um, have the right tools uh, for that. But in terms of prioritization, definitely there's a couple there that we can prioritize in discussing. Um, within the study, we asked our, our we asked the participants of the study how they how well they felt supported by the organization on a scale from zero to hundred. Zero being I do not feel supported supported at all by my organization to 100 being really strongly uh, supported by my organization. Year over year, as you can see on the chart on the um, right hand side, uh, we're seeing a significant drop as organizations kind of stop, at least for the last few years. Um, a lot of organizations are dropping a lot of the initiatives that, that they started during COVID. You know, if you look at the, a comparison of those, and if you look at the, the comparison of those who are burnt out versus uh, those or not, oh, sorry, um, that jump um, is extremely high in terms of how well supported they feel uh, they are by the organization versus uh, those who are not feeling um, burned out. Um, as you can see there for the community service and the Australian population is relatively uh, similar in 55 and 54, and same with the global organization about that 51. Um, of 100. What we um, we wanted to dig a little bit deeper into, what does that mean, organizational support? And what we uh, looked at was things like engagement, psychological safety, belonging, and belonging. And what we you, what you can see, Has John frozen fathers or just for me? He froze for me as well. <laughs> oh dear. Yeah, he's frozen for me. Uh, oh, he's oh. back. There Hello. he is. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I don't know what happened. All good. Um, I just wanted yeah. to ask one quick question. Is there a way to like access this document just to print it? Because I've tried printing it for like at home sakes and for personal use. But um, I can't print it because the words keep cutting out. Do you mean do you mean the PowerPoint slides, Lily? Yeah. We can send that to you. Yeah. Is that possible? If yeah. it can be just like a PowerPoint doc, like document, just because like the way it's coming through is I keep downloading it as like a Chrome thing, and it's oh, not yeah. really. And it's not really downloading properly, and it keeps cutting off the words when I'm printing, which is really annoying. So do you? Yeah, you, don't, you mean the presentation, not the 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 burnout report itself? Just because the click the link that you sent in the chat, it's got when you download it, it doesn't open up in PowerPoint. It opens up in Chrome. Oh, that that. Um, that I linked in the chat, Lily, that's actually the report itself. That's not a PowerPoint presentation. Oh. Oh, there is okay. A, there's a button there you can uh, click uh, to download the report. Um, it's sort of halfway down. You'll see there's a link. Yeah, there. that's what I've done, and it's not print. It keeps cutting off the words. That's the uh -huh. thing. Okay, we, we might work with you after this session, Lily, to um, figure out how we can get uh, it to you. All right, thank you guys so much. Sure. Sorry for interrupting. Sure. No, no, no. Um, sorry for that interruption. Um, as you can see on the screen here, uh, those who are not burned out, more engaged, have higher sense of psychological safety and belonging, and feels a lot more supported uh, by their organization than people who are not uh, burned out. Uh, what we have seen in one of the organizations um, that we work with um, on burnout, um, 
one thing that they did was you know, from two years ago to last year, they doubled down on their work on creating that sense of psychological safety and belonging. And they saw a 10% drop in the level of burnout within the organization. So you know, as we commonly think about um, workload as the primary driver for that, um, it kind of shows that there are different ways to um, alleviate and kind of address uh, this type of problem. And a lot of it really takes that tailored kind of kind of thinking of what will work for your organization uh, right, right now. Um, and so that, I just want to quickly kind of illustrate that it's just not just one way to kind of address um, burnout. And the key is really to understand what's making the biggest impact for your organization. Uh, the third one here, we'll spend a lot of time here because it's pretty general knowledge that if you are experiencing burnout, that's really going to affect your productivity and your quality of work. So those who are not burnt out year over year, they 38% reported being more productive than they were 12 months ago. 46% reported producing much higher quality of work um, than they were 12 months ago versus those who are burnt out. Uh, for those who are burnt out, 53% reporting being less productive and 46% reporting producing lower quality of work. And as you can kind of imagine, you know, with those type of numbers, you know, in organizations that are already quite resource uh, constrained, if you have that population, say we use that 34% of the population who are 50% uh, less productive than that, the strain that it creates on everyone else and for the organizations and uh, ultimately for the, the clients uh, that you're serving, what type of pressure that really um, uh, creates there. So the next finding here is one that I really found uh, was probably the most interesting uh, one uh, from last year's study, which is you know, the debate continues in terms of hybrid uh, work. And we often wonder about the effects that that may have on uh, burnout. So it's the relationship between where you work and burnout, and you know, is there data to actually support bringing people back into the office? Uh, what we found with the global population was that those working two to three days reported the highest level of well-being and organizational support. This group also showed the lowest levels of burnout. Interestingly, the group that had the highest level of burnout was actually those working from home over 80% of the time. So if you do four or more days, um, from home, as you can see on the chart on the right-hand side, they had the highest level of people um, feeling like they're burnt out. Now, obviously, this is correlation, not causation, so we don't know if working from home is burning them out or if they're burned out, so they're staying uh, from home. So we'll do this year, we'll continue to kind of dive deeper into uh, this um, uh, into this insight. Now. On the Community Services Index, so a chart on the left-hand side, the data actually tells a slightly different story. So due to the nature of the work, um, you know, many of those who work in the sector have to go to a workplace, and hence working primarily from the workplace is the only way that they, um, that they, they can wor work. So in those cases, we do see that working from an office or store or, uh, or their place um, of work is um, that's where we see the highest levels of, um, of burnout. So for, you know, there's definitely value when we kind of think about um, the differences between frontline and maybe kind of office uh, based uh, roles that there's definitely value in bringing people back to the office for a few days a week. However, we really need to kind of reimagine what we can do in the office versus working at home. Right, like having people come in and be on Teams all day is not a good use of anybody's <laughs> time. And for and, and within the sector, I think that a rethink is really needed uh, in terms of well, how do we you know for those frontline workers who have to go somewhere um, to do their work, how do we make this um, and how do we create that environment where um, we they can, they can get some of the benefits. Uh, that you see from going to an office or going to a, a location. Uh, one organization that one organization that um, we worked with, um, they 
they have uh, quite a few different offices uh, or locations where they provide service and they have started allocating people to work in different um, locations during different weeks. And what they found was just that, um, not novelty, but you know, that just that change in scenery in where people are working um, has even you know, a little thing like that has um, helped improve some of their well-being uh, in just the role that they're doing is, is slightly different. They work with uh, they work with different people, so they're able to kind of grow uh, their n network. They are able to kind of and they're growing different skills because each location does something uh, slightly different. So uh, the conversation really um, needs to be there on how do we even for the frontline workers, how do we balance that out, uh, and how do we think about how we can make their experiences. Um, good as well to have that really positive impact on when they go into the office. Now, for the last couple of years, every organization has been under pressure to attract and retain their people in a really tight labor market. I think I'm sure everyone on this call is well uh, aware of that and probably feels that pressure. And we know that burnout um, is a key reason why people are leaving organizations. And so in this year, in Last year's uh, research, we wanted to know why people are actually staying and what they would leave the organization for. Uh, this, as you can see on the chart here, um, the stay reasons are pretty much in line with um, previous research and pretty similar in terms of um, the CSI, the community services uh, population and the global population, which is flexible work arrangements, fair and equitable pay alignment, uh, with value, supportive colleagues, and fulfilling work. So um, it's all quite uh, similar. What's interesting, um, and there's a big difference here in the attraction part. So what would attract me to another organization? Or you know, what would make me leave my current um, organization? And what you can see there from that global population, and also in, within the CSI, which is coming up a second, is that increased compensation. Now, historically, compensation is almost never a top reason why someone leaves an organization. Uh, it, it might be top 10, but it's never in that really high um, because pe people do leave for um, other reasons um, than that. But in this kind of age of kind of the, the wage stagnation and the really high inflation that we're facing, it's really become a top reason. So it's just something to kind of think about. Um, while I know for most organizations, that is not something that they have a lot of room to play around with or just have a lot of flexibility on. As you look at these th other things on what would attract me to another organization and what would keep me here in the last slide, um, think about how you might be able to really uh, strengthen some of these other areas. For example, you know, like that flexible work arrangement, that is something that people are looking for. So how do we make ourselves or our organization more um, flexible and make that a much more attractive uh, kind of area for, for people um, rather than purely looking at compensation? What we do know is that, all, all we know is that research has found that 48% of people would accept a slightly lower pay if it meant providing them with more flexibility or more support uh, control over their work lives. So things like the four day uh, work week is something that's been trialed um, over the world, uh, something to kind of think about too. I know these things are not easy. It's one thing to do the research on, on seeing this, but to actually make that happen uh, is quite challenging. Um, but my challenge actually uh, to everyone really is, you know, in terms of the, that compensation and flexible arrangements and all of these other factors, you know, my challenge is that I think we we can we can do it. Right? I, I think we can both pay people properly and create a sustainable kind of work in, environment. I, it shouldn't be one or the other. If you see, um, if you read kind of at the bottom there, um, one thing that was quite interesting for those who are experiencing burnout, these are the factors that they have indicated on why they would leave for another organization. Um, for a better work-life balance, they would leave for better flexibility in their work arrangements, healthier work cultures, increased compensation, and four-day uh, work weeks.
So as I mentioned before, organizations and leaders are quite aware of this burnout problem, right? And they are pouring lots of resources and money into kind of wellness-centric initiatives. Across the globe, nine out of 10 organizations around the world offer some form of wellness uh, program. Uh, the well-being industry has grown from has grown into a hundred billion dollars uh, industry uh, per year in the U.S. alone. So it, it's become even in the last few years, it has just grown as exponentially. If you look at the, the whole technology apps world, there's an app to track everything and help you with uh, everything. There's definitely not a shortage of well-being apps out there that claims that you know if you just download this app and follow its instructions, you're going to solve your burnout problem. Um, there's been two studies, one in, 19, in 2019 and one in 2023 um, by Harvard Medical School and the other one by University of Oxford, um, really repeated this study about the effectiveness of these wellness uh, programs. Um, and they both kind of showed that they really had no impact in the overall health, sleep quality, or the, any of the markers um, of, of health uh, that they claim to that they claim uh, to address. And, you know, if you know, think about what we were talking about earlier about here's the root issues and how difficult it is to address things like uh, workload and work demand and uh, providing more control and autonomy versus here's a new app that we've signed up for for all of our people to, um, you know, it's a lot easier to do that. And leaders, rightly so, and I think they come in with a, with the, with the right mindset, like they want to do something for their people. And it's just the easier way to do that rather than addressing some of those um, root causes. Now, I don't want to sound like I'm against any of these wellness initiatives. I think they're very important to a person's overall health, especially, you know, I think there's things like, you know, sleep hygiene, uh, things like that, very important and like very good for individuals. But if we are looking to address burnout, which is different than addressing individual wellness. These type of programs should not are not the right solutions, and we really need to focus on those organizational uh, kind of causes. High rates of burnout is a powerful warning that the organization, not the individual, needs to undergo meaningful systemic change. I know I keep kind of harping on this, and hopefully this is one of those key messages uh, that you're able to take away. That, um, it's not the individuals uh, when we talk about things like burnout, even though at the end of the day, it is those individuals that's affected um, by this symptom. But if we want to address the root causes of that, it is looking at um, the organization and making those systemic uh, type of changes. So I wanted to um, leave a little bit of time to kind of talk about, so how do we create these better uh, kind of workplaces and just a couple of um, recommendations. Now, um, in the uh, report um, with the link um, that was sent earlier, if you look download that report, there's a lot of very specific uh, and um, activities or uh, recommendations that you and your team uh, can can do um, right now. Um, and so I won't go over any of like the more kind of detailed ones, but some of the three of the more broad uh, types of advice. Um, the first one is leaders really need to be provided with the knowledge and tools to alleviate these root causes of problem. What I've repeatedly found is that I think many leaders still don't have a good understanding of what the root causes are. And so they go after things that are that seems like um, they are the right uh, thing to do. So, you know, having these uh, strategy workshops for leadership teams to kind of go over um, those six um, factors. And just kind of a example of what it might look like. You know, within this workshop, you would look at each of those different factors. And then um, what I like to use is sort of um, looking at the determinants of sustainable work. So uh, this is how work, it, this is actually what affects um, the work uh, that's being done. So leadership behaviors. Um, are leaders modeling the type of behaviors that's supportive of sustainable work? You know, are they emailing people about changes at the last minute? Are they um, making sure that they're not 
emailing at all times um, of the day, um, or are they role modeling really good behaviors uh, to make sure that their team kind of follows? Um, the design of work, how is um, how is that work design? Um, let's just use the manageable workload kind of example. So the design of work, um, can one person actually complete the required task within the time allocated? You know, if somebody is on a eight hour shift, is the amount of work um, given to that person, can they actually do it within that eight hour span? You know, as we probably all know, a lot of people, uh, including ourselves, uh, wear multiple hats nowadays. Um, you know, is it even possible for all of that? Or do we really need to kind of redesign and rethink about, rethink the work that a person needs to do? And, it, and the last one is um, ways of working. So we're talking about some of the culture, some of the, the ways of working um, within that organization. So when it comes to manageable workload, do we have the efficient and modern processes or do we have we used, are we utilizing technology to kind of help our people do the work that they need uh, to be doing? So kind of going through this type of um, exercise within the leisure team to really create that, okay, so, this is our ideal state of working, right? This is our ideal state that we want to get to. And using these types of determinants of work, where do we need to kind of shift the dial and who do we need to kind of engage uh, for that? The second recommendation is listen to your people. You know, this is not one of those things that works with a top-down um, approach. Your people will have probably the best understanding about themselves and what is causing then the stress and how to alleviate that. So co create, co create those solutions with your people and let them own that implementation. Obviously with support and uh, from the leaders, but um, you'd be amazed at you know, what they come up with and how they can um, really help themselves in creating these type of, of solutions. And you know, really come at that with sort of that curiosity and experimental mindset that hey, we're going to try all of these little experiments from different teams within the organizations. And we're going to let some of them you know, might, might not work. Some of them will work. And we'll kind of learn from that and just kind of keep evolving how we do that. We'll share best practices and we'll, we'll do all of that so that um, we can come up with something that's tailored to our organization and our people. And I wish I could tell you, here's the five steps uh, that you can that you need to go do, and everything will be okay. But unfortunately, it's a very complicated kind of issue, and there's just there's nothing like that uh, there. And finally, really think about kind of incorporating a lot more data uh, in terms of measuring and benchmarking um, what's happening within the organization. Um, here's a sample of a benchmarking tool that we use where on the left-hand side, there's six um, areas, uh, job design, leadership, organizational support, REM, social connection, and woke culture. Uh, from previous research, we know that this is what um, the major kind of drivers for um, within the really have a good understanding about the organization. And the process is pretty straightforward. You gather the data, you report and create actions on that. Um, you actually do it and get feedback on that and see kind of share uh, what works, what hasn't worked, and you just kind of keep going around in that. Finally, uh, one thing I would like to invite everyone to um, is actually next year's or this year's uh, burnout uh, study. So the study starts in um, October. It will, will happen in between the October and November uh, timeframe. This year, we're really going to expand our knowledge um, a bit more in looking at a few other um, things. The first is to explore that relationship between psychosocial risk and hazards. I know all of you um, have probably heard a lot about this um, going on, and we really want to have a better understanding of what that relationship to burnout is. Are they the same thing? Are they different? Does one feed into uh, the other or what that relationship uh, really is. Um, again, we are hoping to be able to create that sector specific insight um, to provide that deeper understanding uh, for uh, the sector. And for those organizations that participate, uh, they will be able to kind of compare themselves with uh, the sector. Um, there's a couple, and then there's a couple other sort of insights we're really looking to um, 
dig a little bit deeper into, which is kind of I mentioned earlier about um, that growing trend of burnout being experienced by younger workers. So if any of you work with um, organizational work in organizations that work with younger workers, would love to kind of have a, another chat about partnering uh, on how do we reach out to that population just to check in and make sure um, and see what we find out for that population. Uh, we're going to continue that investigation into burnout in the different work situations. So, uh, for example, four-day work week versus five-day. Uh, we are partnering with the four-day work week organization, uh, and they're going to bring in a lot of organizations that are currently doing the four-day work week, and we'll compare that to the rest of the population and see what um, you know, how that affects uh, burnout. And we'll also look at things like, you know, if you're working two days in the office versus five days in the office and all of those different types of situ work situations. And finally, um, we want to start examining the link. If there might not be any, but we want to say examine between burnout and isolation and loneliness as it works, uh, relates to work environment. As many of you know, you know, loneliness and isolation is a very grow, is a very, real uh, issue within society across all age groups and um, across all groups. And you know, being that our work does work on specifically on that work, in, work and work environment, we wanted to start seeing if there is um, differences uh, between or links between, uh, let's say, remote workers uh, with feelings of isolation and loneliness, and if that actually impacts not just their work life, but into their personal life as well. You know, we kind of talk, um, there's, you probably hear that argument that we want to go to a four-day work week so that for that extra day, um, you can spend more time with your family, you know, fam and, uh, for, with your friends and family. Um, but is that actually the case? Is that actually what happens? Or maybe doing four days a week, you're so focused on doing the work, we actually lose that work relationship. And that actually was a big driver for people uh, in terms of uh, you know, combating loneliness and isolation, what happens then. So we really wanna start that conversation on that. Um, there's more information on our website about this uh, study. Um, there's a link there and we'll send this over to you um, after we're done here. So as I mentioned, unfortunately, there's no quick fixes or silver bullets um, to kind of extinguish um, burnout. And there's, not, you know, there's nothing that a CEO or leadership team can kind of mandate to make this kind of go away. What's really needed uh, is still that movement to change the way that we work. So uh, if you kind of think about this more broadly, it goes beyond single organizations. We got to rethink how work actually happens. I think a lot of our thinking is still based on the industrial age uh, way of working, which is just not working for a lot of people. Okay, so that is all for me. Um, hopefully I've left a little bit of time for some Q&A. About 60 seconds. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> no, John, I, I do wanna say that that was um, really fantastic information. And look, while, as you say, there are no you know, here's the five steps you need to follow to fix this problem. I think you've pro provided some really tangible um, guidance as to the different areas we can focus on in, within our organisations to contribute to uh, preventing burnout in, in our workforce. And uh, while you were talking about those different facets that um, contribute to um, burnout, I was considering, you know, the if you're in, depending on the size of your organisation and where you are in the chain, of authority and leadership, what things you do and don't have some control over and, and can contribute to. And, um, you know, I, I was starting to think about, you know, what the overall look, picture looks like when there's, a, if, it, if each of those facets facets are on a sliding scale and I have a lot of control over this one, I've got no control over this one and, and where you can turn the dial for your own team within, if you're nested, nested within a, a larger organisation, what that might look like. So lots of lots of things to think about. And I really um, encourage all of you to get in, to uh, submit your expression of interest to take part in um, Infinite Potentials uh, survey. Um, really valuable information for us as a sector to use as we um, consider the effects of burnout um, going forward. And if you are in a, um, uh, you're new to a leadership position or you're stepping into a, new, a leadership position, we do actually have a um, 
a three-part series coming up that you may be interested in where we will be talking a little bit about those things you do have influence over, particularly in those middle management type of roles. Um, so if you're interested in taking part in those conversations, I've just popped that, that series in the event um, for, to register for the event in the chat. Thanks so much to you, John. Um, if anyone does want to stay online, I'm happy to stay for a couple of minutes if anyone has a question, but we are at time, so I'll let, let those uh, who need to go, go. Um, but thanks so much, John, for your time. Really appreciate it. Really great. Great. Thanks. Thanks, everybody, for your time.